five. Die five. A new dream a few nights later. This afternoon, Liesl came down this space at sex. Max was halfway through his push-ups. She watched a while without his knowledge, and when she came and sat with him, he stood up and leaned back against the wall. Did I tell you, he asked her, that I've been having a new dream lately? Liesl shifted a little to see his face. But I dream this when I'm awake. He motioned to the glowless kerosene lamp. Sometimes I turn off the light. Then I stand here and wait. For what? Max corrected her. Not for what? For whom? For a few moments, Liesl said nothing. It was one of those conversations that require some time to elapse between exchanges. What do you wait for? Who do you wait for? Max did not move. The fear. He was very matter-of-fact about this. That's why I'm in training. The push-ups? That's right. He walked to the concrete stairway. Every night I wait in the dark and the fear comes down these steps. He walks down and he and I, we fight for hours. Liesl was standing now. Who wins? At first he was going to answer that no one did. But then he noticed the paint cans, the drop sheets, and the growing pile of newspapers in the periphery of his vision. He watched the words, the long cloud, and the figures on the wall. I do, he said. It was as though he had opened her palm, given her the words, and closed it up again. Under the ground, in Molkin, Germany, two people stood and spoke in a basement. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. There's a Jew and a German standing in the basement, right? This, however, was no joke. The Painters, Early June. Another of Max's projects was the remainder of Mein Kampf. Each page was gently stripped from the book and laid out on the floor to receive a coat of paint. It was then hung up to dry and replaced between the front and back covers. When Liesl came down one day after school, she found Max, Rosa, and her papa all painting the various pages. Many of them were already hanging from a drawstring, drawn-out string with pegs, just as they must have done for the standover man. All three people looked up and spoke. Hi, Liesl. Here's a brush, Liesl. About time, so much. Where have we been so long? As she started painting, Liesl thought about Max Vandenberg fighting the Fuhrer exactly as he had explained it. Basement Visions, June 1941. Punches are thrown, the crowd climbs out of wall, the walls. Max and the Fuhrer fight for their lives, each rebounding off the stairway. There's blood in the Fuhrer's mustache, as well as in his part line on the right side of his head. Come on, Fuhrer, says the Jew. He waves him forward. Come on, Fuhrer. When the Visions dis dissipated and she finished her page, Papa winked at her. Mama castigated her for hogging the paint. Max examined each and every page, perhaps watching what he planned to produce on them. Many months later, he would also paint over the cover of that book and give it a new title. After one of the stories, he would write and illustrate inside it. That afternoon, in the secret ground below 33 Himmel Street, the Hubermans, Liesel Memminger, and Max Vandenberg prepared the pages of the word shaker. It felt good to be a painter. The showdown, June 24th. Then came the seventh side of the dive, two days after Germany invaded Russia, three days before Britain and the Soviets joined forces. Seven. You roll and watch it coming, realizing completely that this is no regular dive. You claim to be bad luck, to be bad luck, but you've known all along that it had to come. You brought it into the room. The table could smell it on your breath. The Jew was sticking out of your pocket from the outset. He smeared to your lapel, and the moment you roll, you know it's a seven. The one thing that somehow finds a way to hurt you. It lands, it stares you in each eye, miraculous and loathsome, and you turn away with it feeding on your chest. Just bad luck, that's what you say. Of no consequence, that's what you make yourself believe, because deep down, you know that this small piece of changing fortune is a signal of things to come. You had a Jew you pay, somehow or other, you must. In hindsight, Liesl told herself that it was not such a big deal. Perhaps it was because so much more had happened by the time she wrote her story in the basement. In the great scheme of things, she reasoned that Rosa being fired by the mayor and his wife was not bad luck at all. He had nothing whatsoever to do with hiding Jews, and everything to do with the greater context of the war. At the time, though, there was most definitely a feeling of punishment. The beginning was actually a week or so earlier than June 24th. Liesl scavenged a newspaper for Max Vandenberg, as she always did. She reached in the garbage just can just off Munich Street and tucked it under her arm. Once she delivered it to Max and he commenced his first reading, he glanced across at her and pointed to a picture on the front page. Isn't this who's washing and ironing you deliver? Liesl came over from the wall. She'd been writing the word argument six times next to Max's picture of the ropey cloud and the dripping sun. Max handed her the paper and she confirmed it. That's him. When she went on to read the article, Heinz Herman, the mayor, was quoted as saying that although the war was progressing splendidly, the people of Moking, like all responsible Germans, should take adequate measures and prepare for the possibility of harder times. You never know, he stated, what our enemies are thinking or how they will try to debilitate us. 
A week later, the mayor's words came to nasty fruition. Liesl, as she always did, showed up at Grand Strauss and read from the whistler on the floor of the mayor's library. The mayor's wife showed no signs of abnormality, or let's be frank, no additional signs, until it was time to leave. This time, when she offered Liesl the whistler, she insisted on the girl taking it. Please, she almost begged. The book was held out in a tight, measured fist. Take it, please, take it. Liesl, touched by the strangest of this woman, couldn't bear to disappoint her. The gray-covered book and its yellowing pages fought its way into her hand, and she began to walk the corridor. As she was about to ask for the washing, the mayor's wife gave her a final look of a bathroom sorrow. She reached into the chest of drawers and withdrew an envelope. Her voice, lumpy from lack of use, coughed out the words, I'm sorry, it's for your mama. Liesl stopped breathing. She was suddenly aware of how empty her feet felt inside her shoes. Something ridiculed her throat. She trembled. When finally she reached out and took possession of the letter, she noticed the sound of the clock in the library. Grimly, she realized that clocks don't make a sound that even remotely resembles ticking, talking. It was more the sound of a hammer upside down, hacking methodically at the earth. It was the sound of a grave. If only mine was ready now, she thought, because Liesl Memigra at that moment wanted to die. When the others had canceled, it hadn't hurt so much. There was always the mayor, his library, and her connection with his wife. Also, this was the last one, the last hope gone. This time, it felt like the greatest betrayal. How could she face her mama? For Rosa, the few scraps of money had still helped in various alleyways. An extra handful of flour, a piece of fat. Elsa Herman was dying now herself to get rid of her. Liesl could see it somewhere in the way she hugged the robe a little tighter. The clumsiness of sorrow still kept her at close proximity. But clearly, she wanted this to be over. Tell your mama, she spoke again. Her voice was adjusting now, as one sentence turned into two, that we're sorry. She started shepherding the girl toward the door. Liesl felt it now on her shoulders, the pain, the impact of final rejection. That's it, she asked internally. You just boot me out? Slowly, she picked up her empty bag and edged toward the door. Once outside, she turned and faced the mayor's wife for the second to last time that day. She looked her in the eyes with an almost savage brand of pride. Donkey Sean, she said, and Elsa Herman smiled in a rather useless, beaten way. If you ever want to come just read, the woman lied, or at least the girl in her shocked, saddened state perceived it as a lie. You're very welcome. At that moment, Lisa was amazed by the width of the doorway. There was so much space. Why did people need so much space to get through the door? Had Rudy been there, he'd have called her an idiot. It was all, it was to get all her stuff inside. Goodbye, the girl said, and slowly, with great morosity, the door was closed. Liesl did not leave. For a long time, she sat on the steps and watched Mulkin. It was neither warm nor cold, and the town was clear and still. Mulkin was in a jar. She opened the letter, and at Mayor Heinz Herman, diplomatically outlined exactly why he had to terminate the services of Rosa Huberman. For the most part, he explained that he would be a hypocrite if he maintained his own small luxuries while advising others to prepare for the harder times. When she eventually stood and walked home, her moment of reaction came once again when she saw the Steiner Schneider's Meister sign on Munich Street. Her sadness left her, and she was overwhelmed with anger. That bastard mayor, she whispered, that pathetic woman. The fact that harder times were coming was surely the best reason for keeping Rosa employed, but no, they fired her. At any rate, she decided they could do their best, their own, blessed washing and ironing like normal people, like poor people. In her hand, the whistler tightened. So you give me the book, the girl said, for pity to make herself feel better? The fact that she had also been offered the book prior to that day mattered little. She turned as she had once before and marched back to her eight grand strass. The temptation to run was immense, but she refrained so that she'd have enough in reserve for the words. When she arrived, she was disappointed that the mayor himself was not there. No car was slotted nicely on the side of the road, which was perhaps a good thing. Had it been there, there was no telling what she might have done to it in this moment rich of rich versus poor. Two steps in at a time, two steps at a time, she reached the door and banged it hard enough to hurt. She enjoyed the small fragments of pain. Evidently, the mayor's wife was shocked when she saw her again. Her fluffy hair was slightly wet and her wrinkles widened when she noticed the obvious fury on Liesl's usually pallid face. She opened her mouth, but nothing came out, which was handy, really, for it was Liesl who possessed the talking. You think, she said, you can buy me off with this book? Her voice, though shaken, hooked at the woman's throat. The glittering anger was thick and unnerving, but she toiled through it. She worked herself up even further to the point where she needed to wipe the tears from her eyes. You give me this so much of a book and think it'll make everything good when I go and tell my mama that we've just lost our last one? While you sit here in your mansion? The mayor's wife's arms, they hung. Her face slipped. Liesl, however, did not buckle. She sprayed, sprayed her words 
directly into the woman's eyes. You and your husband sitting up here. Now she became spiteful, more spiteful and evil than she thought herself capable. The injury of words. Yes, the brutality of words. She summoned them from some place she only now recognized and hurled them at Elsa Herman. It's about time, she informed her, that you do your own stinking washing anyway. It's about time you face the fact that your son is dead. He got killed. He got strangled and cut up more than 20 years ago. Or did he freeze to death? Either way, he's dead. He's dead and it's pathetic that you sit here shivering in your own house to suffer for it. You think you're the only one? Immediately, her brother was next to her. He whispered for her to stop, but he too was dead and not worth listening to. He died in a train. They buried him in the snow. Liesl glanced at him, but she could not make herself stop. Not yet. This book, she went on. She showed, shoved the boy down the steps, making him fall. I don't want it. The words were quieter now, but still just as hot. She threw the whistler at the woman's slippered feet, hearing the clack of it as it landed on the cement. I don't want your miserable book. Now she managed it. She fell silent. Her throat was barren now, no words for miles. Her brother, holding his knee, disappeared. After a miscarriage pause, the mayor's wife edged forward and picked up the book. She was battered and beaten up and not from smiling this time. Lisa could see it on her face. Blood leaked from her nose and licked at her lips. Her eyes had blackened. Cuts had opened up and a series of wounds were rising to the surface of her skin, all from the words, from Liesl's words. Book in hand and straightening from a crouch to a standing hunch, Ilsa Herman began the process again of saying sorry, but the sentence did not make it out. Slap me, Liesl thought. Come on, slap me. Elsa Herman didn't slap her. She merely retreated back, backward into her ugly air of beautiful house. When Liesl once again was left alone, clutching at the steps, she was afraid to turn around because she knew that when she did, the glass casing of Mulkin had now been shattered and she'd be glad of it. As her last orders of business, she read the letter one more time, and when she was close to the gate, she screwed it up screwed it up as tightly as she could and threw it at the door as if it were a rock. I had no idea what the book thief expected, but the ball of paper hit the mighty sheet of wood and twittered back down the steps. It landed at her feet. Typical, she stated, kicking it into the grass, useless. On the way home this time, she imagined the fate of that paper the next time it rained, when the mended glass house of Mulkin was turned upside down. She could already see the words dissolving letter by letter till there was nothing left, just paper, just earth. At home, as luck would have it, when Liesl walked through the door, Rosa was in the kitchen, and she asked, where's the washing? No washing today, Liesl told her. Rosa came and sat down at the kitchen table. She knew. Suddenly, she appeared much older. Liesl imagined what she'd look like if she untied her bun to let it fall out onto her shoulders, a gray towel of elastic hair. What did you do there, you little so much? The sentence was dumb. She could not muster her usual venom. It was my fault, Liesl answered. Completely. I insulted the mayor's wife and told her to stop crying over her dead son. I called her pathetic. That was when they fired you? Here. She walked to the wooden spoons, grabbed a handful, and placed them in front of her. Take your pick. Rosa touched one and picked it up, but she did not wield it. I, do, I don't believe you. Lisa was torn between distress and total mystification. The one time she desperately wanted a Boston, she couldn't get one. It's my fault. It's not your fault, Mama said. And even she even stood and stroked Liesl's waxy, unwashed hair. I know you wouldn't say those things. I said them. All right, you said them. As Lisa left the room, she could hear the wooden spoons clicking back into position in the metal jar that held them. By the time she reached her bedroom, the whole lot of them, the jar included, were thrown to the floor. Later, she walked down to the basement where Max was standing in the dark, most likely boxing the Fuhrer. Max, the light dimmed on, a red coin floating in the corner. Can you teach me how to do the push-ups? Max showed her and occasionally lifted her torso to help. But despite her bony appearance, Lisa was strong and could hold her body weight nicely. She didn't count how many she could do. But that night in the glow of the basement, the book thief completed enough push-ups to make her suck her hurt for several days. Even when Max advised her that she'd already done too many, she continued. In bed, she read with Papa, who could tell something was wrong. It was the first time in a month that he'd come in and sat with her, and she was comforted, if only slightly. Somehow Hans Hurman always knew what to say, when to say, and when to leave her. Perhaps Liesl was the one thing he was a true expert at. Is it the washing, he asked. Liesl shook her head. Papa hadn't shaved for a few days, and he rubbed the scratchy whiskers every two or three minutes. His silver eyes were flat and calm, slightly warm, as they always were when it came to Liesl. When the reading petered out, Papa fell asleep. It was then that Liesl spoke what she had wanted to say all along. Papa, she whispered, I think I'm going to hell. Her legs were warm, her knees were cold. She remembered the nights when... She had wet the bed, and Papa had washed the sheets and taught her the letters of the alphabet. Now his breathing blew across the blanket, and she kissed his scratchy cheek. You need a shave, she said. You're not going to hell, Papa replied. 
For a few moments, she watched his face. Then she lay back down, leaned on him, and together they slept, very much in Munich, but somewhere on the seventh side of Germany's die.